This recording is one of the recordings that cover an introduction to the nervous system in regards to protection of the central nervous system. And this one will address looking at the cerebral spinal fluid, circulation of it, as well as the function of it. It'll also include um, the blood brain barrier. So let's start with cerebral spinal fluid. So cerebral spinal fluid is fluid that circulates through something called the subarachnoid space around the brain and in the spinal cord and within also is located within the ventricles these certain cavities in the brain we're going to be looking at those as well it's also going to be found in something called the central canal of the spinal cord now cerebral spinal fluid is about um, 150 mils that we have total volume and about a total of about a liter of cerebral spinal fluid is actually secreted every day um, so it's pretty much we're replenishing that 150 mils about every three or four hours. So let's just look at where it's produced, how it circulates before we look at the functions of it. Um, but I want to show you um, some of the places that you find it is you see here with this, the blue is representing or these are these cavities in the brain and they're filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Um, they're also going to be found in the subarachnoid space, which will kind of become around in here, and it's also going to be running down in that central um, canal of the spinal cord. Now, the uh, within those ventricles of the brain, eat, we actually have, I'll come back here, is we have four ventricles. One, two, three, four. Each of those ventricles contains something called the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is responsible for production of the cerebral spinal fluid. What it's made up of is you have here, this is pia mater. You see capillaries, which are blood vessels. And the green represent ependymal cells, those neuroglial cells. This whole structure is referred to as the choroid plexus. So what happens is, is you have things like um, glucose and oxygen, various ions that are going to be taken up from the blood capillaries and bring, brought in and used to make this, the CSF. And the same in the same regards that choroid plexus is going to also be involved in kind of removal of carbon dioxide and wastes they're coming in this direction now the um, ependymal cells what you'll notice has very tight junctions so it's going to very tightly restrict what can cross that blood vessel and get up into the brain so in order for to get certain things, you better have some transport proteins to get it. So we have transport proteins for what we want. Um, those ependymal cells um, have the cilia and the microvilli, which I had mentioned previously. So the, the cilia help with um, circulation of the CSF. The microvilli aid in that secretion and absorption that takes place. That pia mater, which is one of your meninges, that's impermeable to CSF. Um, so, but it will be absent between um, these when we look at the circulation in the the various foramen, um, the connections between um, the different ventricles um, in the, within the brain. Now, the choroid plexus creates. So you remember C creates. The CSF and it will circulate around the brain well actually it's made and you'll see kind of where you see the pink that each one of them represents a choroid plexus you see one here and here and here is it's made in each of the ventricles and it actually circulates around the two there's actually two lateral ventricles and we don't say which was one which is two because they're on the sides. You have two lateral ventricles. This one here is the third ventricle because it's the third one. And down here is the fourth one. And I'm actually, I like this picture better, so I'm actually going to start with this picture. 
is that CSF will go from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle through a structure called the interventricular foramen because it's between the ventricles. Foramen is a word that means opening. It will then travel to the third ventricle. The third ventricle, from the third ventricle I should say, it travels to the fourth ventricle via something called the cerebral aqueduct. Aqueduct kind of aqua means water, duct to carry. So it's carrying this fluid to the fourth ventricle. Now that fourth ventricle, um, from the fourth ventricle, it can go down to the central canal, which is in the central part of the spinal cord. But it also may go to, let's see if I can get to it, oops, to the um, subarachnoid space via these openings. We have lateral aperture and we have two median. Oh, sorry, one median, two lateral apertures. Um, the, they will, uh, kind of like aperture is again kind of a word that means opening, and it will go into the subarachnoid space, and you kind of see it's kind of coming around that top part of the brain. So remember, the subarachnoid space is between the arachnoid matter and the pia matter, and it will circulate there, and we have a subarachnoid space down in the spinal cord too, and here's that central canal. It will circulate around the arachnoid granulations, which you see right here, are um, from that the arachnoid matter, and they're going to be in, responsible for reabsorbing that CSF and returning the waste products or other stuff that it, that came from the CSF into your venous system. So it will continuously circulate. Now CSF does circulate down your spinal cord and it goes down your spinal cord right here. This is actually the end of your spinal cord right there. That CSF will continue to circulate a little bit past it, about between the, you know, about second to third um, sacral vertebra. Um, uh, that's where you kind of will see it. And just as a, a frame of reference, your spinal cord, if you want to kind of do uh, landmarks, around where your uh, first and second lumbar vertebra are, the spinal cord ends between those two. Um, and, but the CSF will continue to circulate a little bit down to about this, this second sacral um, vertebra. So it circulates around, and so what's its function? Okay, so we, we're constantly making it, what's its function? But I want to show you a lab model. This is a model that's depict, depicting the ventricular system in the brain. Here is a side view. So you see one of the lateral ventricles right here. There's the two lateral ventricles there, so you're looking at it from the front. The pink, what you're seeing in the pink, that's a choroid plexus. So I mentioned that each of the, the ventricles will have a choroid plexus, and you can see them there. On this picture here, you see that is an interventricular foramen. You can see it right there too. Let's do that here. Here is the third ventricle. Here's the cerebral aqueduct, goes down here, and down here is the fourth ventricle. And if you look real carefully, you can kind of see the pink. Um, if you turn this model around, you'll see pink associated with each of the ventricles. Um, so you can kind of see this um, in lab when you look at the models. So what were some of the functions of cerebral spinal fluid? Why do we have it? Well, one of the things it does is it provides buoyancy. Let's do this in a darker color to the brain. It actually helps um, to kind of keep that brain kind of floating. And this, what you see here, this is someone who actually had a CSF leak. And you see the CSF is kind of low. And actually what happens is the brain kind of shrinks down, causes some headaches, causes cause some problems. It, Having kind of making that brain buoyant up there in the skull helps to reduce the weight of it by about 97%. They say the weight of the brain is about 100 or 1400 grams, but with having it surrounded by the CSF, it reduces it to about 50 grams. So it makes it allows that brain to be a little bit buoyant. Um, it also is, I, I like to think of it as like a bubble wrap is it protects the brain and spinal cord from impact damage. I think it was like a 
shock absorber, think of a bubble wrap. Now concussions will occur when the force of the impact is beyond the ability of that CSF to act as a cushion to impact that. So we do get concussions as a result if it's not enough to, to um, cushion that impact. Um, so it's kind of protective, um, you know, surrounding it. Other thing it does is it removes, helps remove waste products. So removal of wastes. It helps to um, deliver nutrients. It's actually a transport medium for delivery of nutrients. And various chemical signals. Say it, it um, ensures a constant ionic environment for that nervous tissue. Makes it make sure it's stable. Um, so it's it's nutritive. Um, the composition of cerebral spinal fluid is different composition um, from your blood. The the protein concentration is different. The glucose concentration is different from the blood. I'm not going to go over what specifically it is, but it is different. Okay, so I can just pretty much say it is different from what it is from your blood. So, other thing I want to look at is the role of your blood brain barrier. So, you've got the cerebral spinal fluid, which is that clear, it's actually kind of it's a clear fluid that surrounds that brain, has a nutritive function, protective function. Now, we've got the blood brain barrier. So, blood brain barrier, this is um, where you have very tight junctions in the blood vessels that are maintained by factors secreted by the astrocytes. It keeps certain things out of that nervous tissue. Things that are normally would be in your blood, I don't want in the nervous tissue because it could excite the brain or damage the brain. And so it's very selective of what can come in and come out. So glucose, no problem. Got plenty of carriers for that because the, glu the brain has a very high dependence on glucose. Um, it keeps out certain things like um, certain uh, chemicals out of it. Um, and they very carefully control the iron concentration too. Now the, there are places where that barrier is not completely intact for a reason. Because we need, in all of them, what you'll see, the, fun the, the commonality is Areas where we have to have hormones be able to be released into the bloodstream. So one of the places, um, actually I'll do, let you look at this picture first, is if the blood-brain barrier is breached, kind of go crazy. Don't want that. So if it's damaged, there can cause some problems. So we're going to have ex you know premature excitability of that tissue. We don't want it. So we want to make sure we have a barrier there. Be very selective for what can come in. So one of the places where we have is where it's not intact is parts of your hypothalamus. So hypothalamus, you see, is actually right up in here. On this model, here's your hypothalamus right in here. Okay. So parts of your hypothalamus produces these hormones that are regulatory hormones that actually travel down through a specialized capillary network that you see here to the anterior pituitary, which it, because it regulates the secretion of hormones by the anterior pituitary gland. On this model, here's your pituitary gland. The anterior pituitary would be in the front. Posterior pituitary would be back here. The white wire that you see is called the infundibulum. So it's like a, like a funnel. Um, so but we don't have an intact blood brain barrier in parts of the hypothalamus where we need to have those hormones travel down to the anterior pituitary to control secretion of hormones such as those hormones can control things like um, the uh, prolactin and growth hormone and thyroid stimulating hormone and a number of different hormones. Other places where we'll have that breach will be in the posterior pituitary. So here it's showing you, here's the posterior pituitary. So on this, just so you know that this is the front, this is the back. On this one, this, is the, this over here is the front, 
and this is the back, the way that you're, look, you're looking at it, is what you see here, optic chiasm, is right there, okay? So you don't get confused. Now the posterior pituitary, we have capillaries in the posterior pituitary that will release hormones into your circulation and it produces ADH, or that doesn't produce, I shouldn't say, it, ADH and oxytocin are actually made in the hypothalamus but are transported down via retrograde axonal transport and then they're released from the synaptic knobs into the blood, into the circulation there. So it has to release those hormones. So there we don't have an intact blood brain barrier. The other place is in the pineal gland. So the pineal gland is a pine cone shaped structure. That's why they got its name. On this model, it's the one that says 23. It's this little tiny little area right there. The pineal gland produces a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone that regulates your sleep wake cycles kind of determines when you need to go to sleep and wake up. So um, there's another place where um, that blood brain barrier is not intact. So we're gonna leave it there. Look for another recording that talks about some clinical correlations associated with um, the meninges and cerebral spinal fluid.